Diego. Oh, good. So good to yeah. meet you properly after so all this time. I'm I'm such a fan of your writing, and yeah. I actually got um, your book Inward gifted to me by a friend who was mm-hmm. like, "You're gonna love this," and it's been one of those books that. It will be in different rooms in the house, and I just pick it up every now and again, and you usually open it on a page with the the thing that you need that day. Oh, that's so nice, because I love the fact that people, they don't need to read the whole book. They can yeah. just open it and get something that they need. Yeah. It's like a helpful friend, yeah. I think. <laughs> I love it. Um, and we're going to talk about your new book today, Lighter, as well. But before we do that, can you sure. just talk to us about your pen name, Young Pueblo, and, yeah, and the yeah, meaning definitely. behind it, just so people get yeah. the real context of your writing? Yeah, so the name Young Pueblo, Pueblo, it kind of brings together my Americanness with my Ecuadorianness. So I was born in Ecuador, and the word pueblo there is often used to refer to like the masses of people. And um, young just means the word young. I just dropped the O. And when I started meditating, that's when the name actually took meaning because I started realizing not only am I really immature, but the world as a whole, we have a lot of growing up to do. And something that I like to kind of come back to is realizing that when we were children, all of our parents, our teachers were trying to teach us these fundamental things, like how to clean up after ourselves, how to tell the truth, how to share with each other, how to generally be kind to one another. And as a human collective, we don't know how to do these things yet. Mm. We really struggle at them. So I think think we're in this like sort of transitional period where we're going to do a lot of growing up on the individual level and the collective level. Which is a relief because I think, you know... It's time. (laughs) It's time. But we've been hearing for, I don't know, certainly the last three years in a Mm -hmm. really condensed manner how terrible everything is and that we're ruining the world and that everybody hates each other and it feels so heavy. I think Mm -hmm. at times I wake up feeling anxious and edgy and I don't know why. I think it is because of that non-stop bombardment. But what you're saying is, okay, maybe we have to go through this very rough period, but there is hope, there's optimism. We've got totally. growing to do. Totally. I think there's a lot of hope too. I, yeah. I know that um, you know the media shows so much of the struggles that we have in the world, but they don't do a great job highlighting of how far we've come mm. because there's this beautiful sort of healing generation that's emerging and i think of that as everyone who's alive now right if you're very young or you know in your 80s or 90s uh there are just millions and millions of people in the world who are starting to meditate millions and millions of people who are seeing therapists who are doing different forms of therapy and to me it's like that's the great hope because that's the missing piece you know that's what we were missing before was we never had a way to do this sort of collective work simultaneously with our own internal healing work that's so necessary mm, and i yeah. guess explaining stories like that isn't going to sell newspapers so no no one's no, no one's gonna watch yeah, yeah no one's gonna put that in the news but you're so <laughs> right. right you know and again i guess that sort of um looking at how people are turning inwards looking mm-hmm. to heal from their past generational trauma that's right. happened using these new well they're not new methods they're extremely old and esoteric but in terms of the modern world like you say people are meditating they're trying yoga for the first time they're trying all of these beautiful practices that are out there to heal themselves and we're not highlighting that at all it's it's really strange no not at all and it's eastern and western practices yes because one thing that i've found is like i love meditating you know i i practice in the sn goenka tradition i practice vipassana And it works great for me, but it doesn't mean it's going to work great for every single human being. So the type of conditioning that I carry in my mind can be very different from what you've gone through, what your emotional history has shaped, and the the, different traumas or different old hurts that you've accumulated. So the tools that you may need may be very different from what I need. So it's fantastic that we live in a time in history where people have access to a multitude of different techniques. Yeah, without a doubt. And it's so interesting once you start digging into it and looking at either the the place that you were born or the place that you reside now, which sort of practices have been used. I love researching witches in the UK. Yeah. You know, there was a, all, yeah. obviously a terrible time when all the witches were right. burned at the stake and mm-hmm. all of these amazing practices went completely out the window mm-hmm. and learning about the, the, the breadth of knowledge that these amazing men and women had and carried, which sort of got lost. It's so fascinating and it's great that people are now 
showing an interest into yeah. all of these yeah. different tools and methods to feel more grounded, healed, whatever it might be. And of course, in, in your new book, Lighter, it is a much more personal book. I yes, know that Inward's right. very personal, but your story is shared right, in this right, book. And right. the book opens in the year 2011, mm -hmm. where you were in a cycle of drug use at the yes, time. Yeah. And you found yourself sort of lying on the floor, heart beating really yep. fast. Was there an instant realisation in that moment? Was there a sort of incremental, I guess, starting way before 2011, a realisation that change was needed or healing was needed? Yeah, I mean, in that moment, right, I had sort of hit that breaking point where my body just couldn't handle anymore because it had been a number of years of drug abuse and drug abuse that was related to me just trying to run away from my own emotions. And... When I hit that point, I really started seeing like different parts of my life. And the first thing I saw was my parents, right? Like I emigrated to the United States when I was about four years old uh, with my parents and they worked so hard. And part of the problem was that when we got to the United States, like we went through a lot of serious poverty and seeing my parents in that constant struggle of trying to figure out how to pay the rent, how to get food on the table. And, and it wasn't, you know, they were like extremely hard workers. But the situation was that there was no upward mobility for us at that time because my mom, she worked cleaning houses. My dad worked at a supermarket and, you know, they, they worked very hard but made very little. And I think going through that experience with them just created so much sort of sadness and anxiety and a scarcity mindset that um, I had no way of processing. So when I was, you know, laying in the floor there, I could see how much I was... Um, just caring and how heavy my mind had gotten. And I knew, I was like, if I continue this way, I'm going to lose my life. Um, so all, my only option is to figure out a way to make my mind lighter. Mm. Do, do you think um, at the point when you'd started using drugs, and I'm not mm. sure if that felt recreational at first and then turned into something oh, more just, serious. It was casual at first. It was casual for, yeah. you know, for Ca fun totally. in your head. Yeah. Did you, did you have a, a moment where you realized, oh... I know I'm not doing this for the right reasons. Or or is there a sense of numbing in that cycle where you're just not even going there with the thoughts and the feelings about yeah. why? Well, I was oblivious to the pattern. I didn't see it until I hit that breaking point where whenever I would feel sadness or tension or some anxiety, I would quickly roll up another joint or, you know, make sure that I'm just sort of intoxicated in some manner or another or that I'm totally externalized where I'm either just like joking with friends or playing video games or just doing something so that I'm not paying attention to myself. Mm. And it wasn't until I hit that breaking point where I was like, I realized, okay, I got here because I've been working so hard at lying to myself. I didn't want to admit that I didn't feel good. How in that moment did you not fall into self-loathing? Because I think sometimes when you hit rock bottom or you realize, and I've certainly experienced this myself, like mm -hmm. what I'm doing doesn't work anymore. It's so easy to slide into absolute self-loathing mm -hmm. because you go, I've been getting it wrong. I've yeah. been doing the wrong thing. I've certainly got the propensity to fall into that self-loathing quite yeah. easily. And yeah. I have to work to go, no, that's yeah. not the route to go down. But how did you stop yourself in that moment? That's a great question. I think um, it was two things. I mean, one was that I didn't feel great about myself. Like once I realized and like that self-awareness started growing, I was like pretty bummed out with how I had gotten to that point. But the other end of that was that when I hit that rock bottom moment, um, I knew that like I was way too close to losing my life. Like I really, you know, I talked to a doctor later and she was like, yeah, what you're describing sounds like you had a mild heart attack. Wow. And I was like, well, dang, I was like, if I keep going, I'm done. You know, so I had to put away the hard drugs and then I had to just start dealing with my emotions and my mental issues and just start um, doing that like deep healing work. But um, at first, what I what I experienced was like the sadness of just like, how did I get here? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's really brilliant you saying this because I think so many people will perhaps have that self-reflection and go, oh, it, you know, are my patterns working for me here? But of course, it's yeah. not like an epiphany. Yay. Everything's great now. No. I've realized yeah. that this hasn't been working. So now here's on to a fresh start. It's a long hard journey yeah. to heal, to yeah. break patterns. And like you say in the book, one of the first things is having self-awareness of yeah. going you know, and, and recognizing your own patterns. And I, I had a, 
a situation um, that there probably wasn't one particular rock bottom in the context of of this habit that I had, but I I was on off bulimic for for ten years, mm. and it, exactly mm-hmm. the same way I wanted to numb, I wanted to run from myself, I didn't yeah. want to deal with the emotions, and. I sort of incrementally went, oh, God, this is making me physically very ill. And also I can see that it's not working anymore. But then you've got to go, right, well, what are these patterns? And also, why are they there? And, you know, you say in the book, when you look at your own upbringing and the poverty that ensued after Mm -hmm. you'd, you'd gone to the States. Yeah. You, your solution at first was, I'm going to be an investment banker. I want to earn loads of money <laughs> and, I, and I want to do better. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's kind of, that's an instant, I can solve that problem. Right. But right. actually, there's usually a surface problem. And, mm-hmm. I, and I don't want to use that term uh, in a reductive way because the surface problem can be a bloody big problem. Yeah. Yeah. But there's like a root problem. There's right. something beneath right. that. How do you get to that? Oh, that's a great point. I mean, I... I It's exactly what you said. You know, I really, I could see the sort of major problem was like, how can I help pull my family out of this situation? And that's what I thought in college made most sense was, okay, well, I need to be an investment banker. They make a ton of money. I need to go into this field. And, you know, I was studying economics in college and I'm actually, I'm glad that I did because I learned a lot. Um, But I, as soon as I got out and I, you know, got my first job in a bank, I was out of there in a month. Mm -hmm. Like I was out of there so quick because it was actually exacerbating the problems that I had not yet dealt with. Like this was before I hit my rock bottom moment in uh, the summer of 2011. But what I ended up doing was um, I realized the deeper truth of what I wanted to do because I, you know, even after I stopped doing the hard drugs, I spent this year where I was, you know, I had different jobs and was doing different things, but nothing yet serious where I, where I felt like I had a calling. Sort of every my life sort of felt on pause because I had to just focus on just like realigning my habits so I could live well. And it wasn't until I started meditating and I started sort of burning away the, those first few layers of the heavy mind of that heavy conditioning that I was carrying where it kind of came up and was like, whoa, like, you know, you should start writing. You should start, um, like, this creativity came up that I had never accessed. Like, I, I literally had never done any creative writing. So you'd been blocking it with the drugs, no, essentially. No, it was just lit. It was this thickness, this mental thickness that yeah. was just blocking my, like, realer aspiration. And when I started to get getting to know my emotions and I started to see, like, okay, I want to live a life that's in service. And when I felt like I came across this sort of, like, great discovery within my own personal life that healing was even possible I was like wait I have to write about this mm. yeah. so at what point so you so let's let's look at everything chronologically so you, you have this rock bottom moment where you mm-hmm. realize things aren't working how long after that did you discover meditation and can you just talk exactly about one year one year yeah, after exactly wow. one and so year. how did that come into your life uh that was through uh, one of my best friends Sam so uh, Sam went on a trip uh, and he was traveling through India and he just like happened across this meditation course. So he did his first silent 10 day meditation course about like, I think like six or nine months before I did mine. And I had never heard of it before. And it was shocking to me that, so he wrote to me and a few other friends an email after he did the silent 10 day course. And he was writing like literally like three pages worth of stuff, like all about love, compassion, and goodwill. And I was like, what the heck is going on? You know, because this, <laughs> is, is, this, guy? <laughs> this is someone who like, I, I love him so much, but we were, we were living in a different context back yeah. then. Like we were just like partying and yeah. having fun and, you know, just like really, you know, just not ever touching these subjects before. And now that, you know, he had gone deep within himself and he realized how important this was. I was shocked. I was, one, bewildered, and two, I was like, wait, uh, whatever happened to him, I need that too. Wow. Yeah. And so tell us about your first experience of meditation. Was there discomfort? Did it you was instantly terrible. love it? Terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm actually really fortunate that Uber and Lyft didn't exist back then because Ooh. I would have just called a car and gotten out of there. <laughs> yeah. See ya. <laughs> that would have been gone. Um, but I, yeah, I, I did my first course in Washington State. That's like all the way on the West Coast of the United States. Um, 
and it was in the middle of nowhere, like nowhere. And I had gotten a ride there, and I remember looking at the person who I'd gotten a ride with, and he wasn't leaving. And I'm like, shoot, I'm like, I just, I, I'm here, you know, I can't go anywhere. <laughs> Um, so it took a few days for me to really get into the practice and I would do my best to listen to the instructions and follow them. But it was just, it was so hard to be with myself 24 seven because you're, you're in a silent meditation course. You're not like looking or talking to anyone. You could ask the teacher questions if you needed, but the vast majority of the time you were by yourself and you were just, you know, working on this technique. And the purpose of the technique is to purify the mind. Like you're literally like, Whatever you have knotted up in this conditioning, it will literally start the deconditioning process. And on the way to the, you know, to real deconditioning, like that old anxiety will come up, that yep. old sadness will come up. So I'm in just in, in there just feeling super tough. But when I got out, I was like, wait, I was like, something's different. Like my mind feels a little bit better. And this is, you know, a huge part of that is you have to sit through the discomfort. Yeah. There's no way out of that. There's, you know, because I think so if you've never meditated before, mm -hmm. and I sort of, sometimes I'm disciplined with it, sometimes I fall off the wagon. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, classic mm -hmm. sort of person that knows it's good for me, but yeah. doesn't have a yeah. daily routine. And I'm constantly saying, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I practice a lot of yoga. So I sort of implement that very regularly as well, which I get a huge amount of peace from. Yeah. But I can really sense those times where, for instance, last week I went for a run and my phone had died. There was no battery life in it. And I was like, I'm just going to have to run without listening to music or a Doing podcast. Doing it raw, yeah. <laughs> and my mind was like, blah, 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 and all this stuff was coming up. And I thought, I am not giving myself anywhere near enough time yeah. on my own and in silence without distraction. And I need to sit in like quite an ugly discomfort actually yeah. like something yeah. I really didn't want to experience stuff I didn't want to think about and it was a bit of a warning sign like wow I'm packing my day out way too quickly yeah. but I think people that haven't meditated before imagine that it is just this zen like peace and you're sat there with a clear <laughs> mind and actually it's probably the reverse when you start <gasps> totally. it's everything's it's coming to this it's chaos the, you see how wild your mind is yeah and that was just sort of astounding because it was like my mind would just jump to the future jump to the past it did want it wanted to spend no time in the present moment mm. and it was funny because when i left the course i was like wait like my mind is much calmer now even though i felt so tumultuous during the course i was like not only does my mind feel lighter but it's calmer and i feel like i have more space in my mind mm -hmm. because it felt so cluttered before and that was when i knew that i needed to keep going because i could notice that my reactions to sort of like things that people would say that i didn't like they just weren't as intense as they were before and i was like there's something big here so I, I kept going back. Because that's what you talk about in the book is an unburdened mind. Yeah. Because from that state, that's where you can make clear decisions. Mm -hmm. Because meditation is not going to take all your problems away. But it's no, certainly no. going to help you react to them in a very exactly. different way. Exactly. Exactly. The ups and downs of life will still happen. Yep. There will still be hard moments, challenging times, even times where you experience some type of hurt because of loss or whatnot. Yeah. But what you do know is you build a different relationship to what's happening and to the sort of the sensations that you're feeling on your body. You know, you're not, you're just not reacting to them as intensely as before. Yeah, because I think that's, again, the problem with, uh, you know, the, the beautiful thing that we've talked about, the wellness um, being sort of ubiquitous now, the conversation mm -hmm. around it and, and the practices hopefully more readily available to everybody. Um, but the, the downside of that is there's, there's a whole industry behind it that can be good at times, but can yeah. also promote this quick fix oh yeah do this yeah. one thing and you are fixed and yeah. there's there's no one wellness anything yeah that's going to fix you but absolutely implement them into your everyday to help ease the the stress and yeah. the the toxicity of the modern world so i think that's you know, it, it's it, it's difficult to talk about because it's not like the wellness industry is problematic. It's how it's expressed. You know, we can use all of this stuff, but as long yeah. as you know, it's not going to miraculously like, yay, I'm fixed. Like, what does that even mean? I'm fixed. Yeah. Well, when you combine wellness and capitalism, you get interesting results. Yes. Right. So I, that's and that's one thing I, I touch on that a little bit in the book. But we need to be really careful with quick fixes because you want to sort of realize that your whole life you every time that you've reacted 
those reactions, they've been accumulated in the mind. And you've been building this conditioning for, you know, just so many days of your lifetime. And to be able to turn that around and start living in a new way, it's going to take time. Yeah. It's going to take a lot of effort. And, and you will get great results, but you need to be okay with it being a slow process. And, you know, just jumping and trying to find the quick, like, five-minute, one-minute fix, it's just it's not going to bring substantial, long-term, life-changing results. No. And like you say, it's got to be tough. Like, bits yeah. of it, you got to look back at horrible things from the past or stuff that you don't want to admit or, you know, all of that stuff is so essential. And um, and, and that's where, you know, that, that deep healing work is, is mm -hmm. in the, the gritty bits, the tough bits, the stuff yeah. that is going to build resilience and, and give you a, a new mindset. And one thing that you mentioned that's very important is during that process, if you're trying um, something new, whether it is meditation or like you say, it could be any practice that feels right to you. Yeah. The one thing to look out for, like one of the banana skins, is doubt. Because mm. as soon as that creeps in, that could lead you back to old negative patterns. Yeah. So how yeah. did you mitigate that? How did you stop the pull of drugs or yeah. any yeah. intoxication? I think probably, and this, it's simple, but the thing that was most helpful, because doubt comes up often, it's, um, it's remembering what results I've already accrued. Um, so not measuring yourself by who you were yesterday, but who you were when you first started the journey. I think that's a much more helpful perspective because from, from today to next week, I could have tons of back and forths. But from where I am now to where I was in you know, the summer of 2011, it's a massive difference. It's almost like two different lifetimes. So whenever I'm like, oh, I'm not making progress or the doubt comes up really strongly, I just try to lean back on the fact that like life has substantially changed and I, you know, the, the, the data is there, like the evidence is there. Yeah. Like I see it, my mother and father see it, my wife sees it and they're like, just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and, it, and it, it seems like so much has come up for you in terms of realization due to your meditation. And one of those is impermanence and the understanding of impermanence and the, the importance of how ever-changing and ephemeral everything is. Yeah. So what's that? How's that improved your life? I mean, impermanence is everything. If I were mm. to summarize to one word that I was that I've been sort of practicing and learning my entire lifetime it's change yeah it's change it's it's embracing the fact that change is happening and I think oftentimes our relationship to change is quite negative you know we fear it we don't want it we want to like stay away from it but we don't realize the positive side of change like change allowed you and I to be having this conversation right now yeah if it weren't for change no one would exist. If the universe were static and nothing were moving, there would be no possibility for life. So the fact that the universe is in this constant flow of movement, it means that we get the opportunity to love, the opportunity to grow, the chance to you know, come out of our, our illusions. And I think that's quite powerful. So to me, I feel like embracing change, it's not only valuable in helping you overcome the storms, right? You'll, you'll be in the midst of a storm and you're like, okay, I, I know that this just can't last forever. It's not going to last. This isn't going to be the entirety of my life. And that's quite helpful. But when you embrace change, it helps you and it inspires you to be more present with the people that you're around because you're like, hey, I'm here. I'm in front of these people that I love. I don't know if, you know, I don't know how long this will last, this like moment in my lifetime. And I've, you know, now that I'm um, like, I'm in my mid thirties, I've seen different moments pass, you know, in this, these periods of life where it's like, you know, maybe you and all your friends live close by and you get to share all these special moments, but those special moments are finite because different people move away. So it's like, okay, let me be here with the people I love and try to produce as much presence as possible because why not enjoy them? Like they're here, they're in front of me. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I can, that resonates massively because I've got kids who are seven and nine and then yeah. stepkids who yeah. are 17 and 20. And the change is, you know, you're visibly seeing Huge. this. And, and sometimes you do feel freaked out by it. Like yeah. time's going too quickly. <laughs> what do I do? But then it, that's also quite beautiful because you have to go, well, this is so precious and yeah. I have to embrace yeah. it rather than, because I can definitely race through things yeah. because I'm looking for a time when I might feel a bit safer. And I'm like, no, you got to just go with the moment that you're in rather than look. I, that's my that's my downfall is looking for something in the future that feels safer where I feel better about the world around me and 
and the the body that I'm in and all of that. I'm like, yeah. well, surely that lives in the future rather than like, no, it's it has to be now. Yeah. It has to be yeah. now. It's it's a tough one. And I think you know our our culture it um keeps death very far away. Yeah, right? it it tries to just remove it as far away as possible and. The reality is like, yes, there will come times where there is loss yep. and the loss hurts. But wasn't it beautiful that I had the opportunity to love someone who was so dear to me, even though it may not have lasted as long as I would have wanted. But the reality is that infinity isn't in our grasp. Yeah. Right. But we did have the chance to like just enjoy their presence and treat them well like that's beautiful yeah it's yeah. about as beautiful as it gets isn't it really yeah. i mean one of the results of denying change or the mm -hmm. concept of change because we can't really deny it i mean i guess the way that we do that is through cravings and you talk about yes. cravings yeah. a lot can you establish what a craving is because i think there's probably some confusion yes. around it versus perhaps healthy desire when yes, do we know when something yes. feels like oh, i really want that and i know and it doesn't have to be a thing but you really have a desire yeah. and it's for with a healthy pursuit versus this a craving how would you distinguish that uh so there's this interesting thing that happened when uh buddhism started coming to the west i think in the initial translations they would say a desire is the root of suffering and that kind of confuses things where, and I felt so comfortable in this tradition. When I first heard uh, our teacher Goenka speak, he would say craving is the root of suffering. And that's very different. Very. Craving is something that has a lot more tension involved in it, where you know you can desire something and you don't get it, but you feel fine. It's okay. But then there are other times where you, you know, want something so bad that you're craving it. And not only are you tense during your pursuit of it, but you're also tense when you get it and you're tense afterwards. And I like to tell people too that, you know, we're all householders, like we're not monks. So we have these responsibilities. We have, you know, kids to take care of, families, and all these things that we should try to accomplish. And that includes us having goals, you know, to make sure we have a house and that we're safe and that people get proper education and whatnot. Those are fine goals to have, but you know that you're sort of moving in the wrong direction when all of the things you're trying to accomplish are sort of wrapped around with tension. And you're just, you know, your mind is just tense and, uh, you know, so uh, attached to wanting these very specific results that you're just miserable during the process and after. It's also with a craving there, subliminally, uh, uh, this sort of direct expectation that everything's going to be okay once you get that. Whereas I think right. with desire sometimes... It, it, you're not even sure sometimes why you're gravitating towards something, but it feels yeah. right. It's more of a feeling, I guess, than like this yeah. need. Yeah, and you also have to ask yourself, why am I postponing my happiness? Like, yeah. Why am I like waiting for this one ephemeral little thing? And then once I get it, like there is this quality of dissatisfaction. Like oftentimes, um, you know, we understand the Buddhist teaching as, you know, coming out of suffering, but suffering isn't the only translation of it. You can also think of it as tension or stress or dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction to some of us may seem much more um, like our lives as opposed to suffering itself where it's not as intense. Yeah, yeah. I guess you you can sort of put it into the everyday and, and the bigger scope of things. Like So say, like many of us, I'm sure we've thought, oh, when I get that pair of shoes, I'm gonna feel so <laughs> wicked and everything's gonna be great. Yeah. And then you love the shoes on day yeah. one and then a week later you're like, Oh, yeah, I bought those shoes. And you've sort of forgotten about it. Do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. it happens with, like, wanting a partner or a job or whatever yeah. it might be. That yeah. Or, like, you know, I'm sure, like me, I, I... Yeah, I was so happy when I got this bomber jacket. And <laughs> I was like, I was like, this is this is the one. This is the one I've been looking for. Jacket. And then I find my mind just, like, last week, it was like, oh, I think I want another one. And I was like, dude, I was like, you literally fell for the trap. You... <laughs> <laughs> you have the awareness that you've fallen for it and it's a great coat. Um, but this is the thing, because I think, you know, I'm sure like me, you know, people who are highly successful, top of their game, but you sense a dissatisfaction. Oh, yeah. Because they want to go to, a, you know, the next yeah. level. It's, it's endless. Like, where do you... So really, it's about purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we were talking about this a little bit before the mics went on. And it's interesting purpose, because first of all, what is purpose? Yeah. And how do you find it? 
And what does it feel like when you've got it so that you know that you're living with purpose rather than this desire that, you know, if you get to this place, everything's going to change? Like, what again, what is the difference? Oh, that's a great question. I wrote something, I mean, I think it's in this book, um, a long time ago, where I crossed out find yourself and instead I wrote heal yourself. And I think it's really valuable. Like if you're really trying to find your purpose, first heal yourself, first start the healing process, because oftentimes our aspirations or what we think that we want are just societally driven. They're like things that our parents told us to sort of try to achieve or what we've been watching on the media. You know, that's where I got the idea of the investment banker. Yep. It's from watching TV. Yep. And I was like, okay, that's that's my way out. But really, that was dumb. That was that was not smart of me. Um, and it wasn't until I started uncovering those sort of thicker layers and started relieving my mind of so much burden that it was like, oh, okay, here's my more raw, real aspiration, and let and my purpose came came forward. It appeared. So to me, I think you know, before you're really trying to find your purpose, do that deeper healing work, and in the midst of that healing work it'll become clear how you can be of service to yourself in the world. How interesting. So really, you have to unburden your mind first. That's the first part is get all yeah. the crap out of the way, like clear yeah. your headspace so totally. that it can it can come forth because it'll be different for everyone. Yeah, because and you and you, you just don't want to fall into the trap of just um, thinking that what you want is real when it's actually just what's been encoded inside of you yeah. by society. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's it's a really tough one to... Yeah try and figure out, um, you know, why am I doing this? What is the goal? What is the reason? Is it driven purely by this feeling that I want to do it? And this is very pertinent in the context of your work because you started writing from mm -hmm. that place of yeah. you were doing the healing. This, these ideas were coming forth. The, your pen name came forth. Mm -hmm. And then all of these beautiful poems in inward and these gorgeous thoughts that you felt at that point courageous enough to put out into mm -hmm. the world it's a big step to have those ideas but then to put them out there yeah it's a different it, thing it took a lot of time i mean yeah. i remember feeling it from my intuition that i should start writing but that was like mid 2013 and i didn't actually start until the very beginning of 2015 so there was like a year and a half of me kind of like is that really real like is that is that really what i should be spending my time on and also realizing, like, I've never written anything before, <laughs> you know, mm. like, besides this, the, the essays that I had to write in, you know, in high school and in, and in university, like, I had never write, written creatively and never, like, made time to actually write, but it just it kept coming up. And I kept feeling that, that pull in that direction. And when I finally decided to give it time, it was really daunting because... Not only did I not believe in myself, but like nobody around me believed in me too. Well, like yeah. you know, all my friends were like, "Are you sure, dude? Like, are you sure you want to do that? Because it's risky to to because I I knew that I needed I needed time. Like, I needed time to figure out my voice as an author, to figure out what topics I really wanted to cover, and what felt like you know the best use of my time to write about. And I later ended up finding out that I really I love writing about personal transformation and about relationships. Um, but that took time for me to really kind of hone out and and it it was um it was a struggle and probably the most challenging part of it all was turning to my wife and telling her like hey like I think uh, like I'm about to do a really risky thing I I'm I'm hoping that you can give me time because we had just moved to New York City and we had just gotten our tiny little like one bedroom apartment in Brooklyn and um and she had found a job as a scientist but i was like hey like do you think you can just give me time so i can figure out if this if writing could be a real thing for us and you know i saw the way she was like you know this like sort of quizzical look that she was giving me like are you really sure <laughs> and i was like look i was like my backup plan is if it doesn't work i'll become a high school history teacher and i'll be very happy doing that because I've been really positively affected by the history teachers that I've had in high school. And um, and she was like, okay. She was like, you know, there's there's like a full plan here. So I, it took me like about two years of um, just honing my craft and then putting out inward. And it wasn't until then when she was like, okay, this is like potentially a real thing. Mm, but how <laughs> brilliant. But it's great that you felt you could have that conversation with her. Yeah. 
your wife's yeah. clearly a brilliant human and saying, yes, please do this she thing. She made a very risky investment. <laughs> but, it's, but it was so the right one. And, you know, you put yeah. this book out, you self-published this, and then it went globally. It flew yeah. around the planet. And, I mean, I can't imagine the feeling of having, you know, words that you felt deeply and that came from that place of healing mm -hmm. and of a mental um, lack of... Uh, just being your brain being clogged up having that space to write these beautiful words and then for them to resonate yeah on yeah. such a huge level that must feel incredible yeah it feels um surreal and hard to calculate yeah you know it's sort of um the numbers have gotten so much bigger that like i don't i can't really honestly tell you that i know what a million is mm -hmm. you know like i remember when i when we crossed that that mo crossed that moment where I, um my followers that reached up over a million, I was just like, whoa, that's a gigantic amount of people. And now that it's like, you know, all like right under three million, um, I it's it's just surreal. Like all I can really connect with are the individual stories that people send to me where it's like, you know, um, thank you so much, like your books have helped me get over a divorce or thank you so much, like, you know, the, the uh, loss of a friend that I've experienced or just different hardships. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's like very real. Like yep. I can, my mind can wrap itself around that. But the actual numbers of it all, it feels like, wow. I can just say wow to it. You yeah. Know? yeah. But it just shows again how many people are up for healing. Yeah. So many people are up for this I stuff. I know. And that's one of the most exciting things about doing in-person events. Like I just, just had an in-person event yesterday and it was 700 people in London and it was just, it was so heartwarming to see so many people take their own journey seriously. Yeah. And I'm like, dang, I'm like, this is what gives me hope. And I, and like, like we said earlier, like, I wish this was on the news, you know, talking oh about God, how too. much people are actually trying to cultivate themselves to just live better lives. Yes. I think yeah. it's one of the worst things that we're living through is that the media is, uh, well, certainly the news, the only yeah. connotation that we have with that word is negative. Exactly. It's not like, exactly. oh, because there's plenty of great news happening yeah. all over the place. Yeah. You know, we we probably hear it more so in maybe our own circles or locally that yeah. someone, you know, got married or someone had a baby or someone got a job promotion or whatever it might be. You hear all this beauty or someone helped someone and it was really a meaningful yeah. connection. Like D During the beginning of the pandemic, um, you remember the guy from the American office who played Jim Halpert? Oh, yeah. He did the Good News Network. Mm -hmm. He did a few episodes of that and that was lovely. Do you know what? I feel like we had the first lockdown... There was this sort of goodwill of like, you know, neighbours helping each other and these stories and the videos of all the um, Italian people stood on their balcony singing opera and it felt like, wow, the news is really good at the moment. Yeah. And then it's gone straight <laughs> back to being horrific. And it's like, yeah. you're so right. If we could hear more about mm -hmm. how many people out there are up for doing this work, are up for improving their own mental state, then I think we'd all feel spurred on more because I think the big problem is we go oh, God, everything is terrible and it all seems yeah. so yeah. just heavy and just insurmountable. And some of that is true, but there's yeah. also a whole other side of the story that we're not looking at. I heard this story, you know, it's coming to mind. There's this organization called Blink Now. It's based in Nepal. And there was it was a woman who she was um, starting a backpacking tour and she got to Nepal and saw that there were so many orphans. And... She called her mom and dad. She was like, mom, like, I'm not going to continue. Like, I'm just going to stay here and I'm going to build an orphanage. Wow. And, I, and now there's like, I think it's like 200 or 300 kids that they have. And, and it's, they're really taking care of them. And not only did it become a home for um, all of these children who don't have homes, but there are all these women who are working as well, who are Nepali women. And it's just this fantastic organization. Wow. And I'm like... When I heard that story, I was just so moved because I'm like, that's beautiful. Like, that's yeah. literally change in action. Yes, and it's yeah. happening all over the place. Yeah. We just don't know about it. Like, we really don't. And it is a huge shame. We need more brilliant stories out yeah. there like that. Yeah. One really important subject that I think is probably the foundation of lots of healing mm. is self-love. Yeah. And I think, again, it gets probably quite misconstrued in this day and age yeah. that... Yeah. It could be seen as self-indulgent or narcissistic when not yeah. talked about correctly. Yeah. But actually, it's bloody important. And yeah. without it, can you really do much healing? I don't know. I mean, self-love, 
the way I like to think about it, right? I like to really separate it from consumerism. Like, yeah. um, you know, sure, from time to time, you know, get yourself the thing that you wanted um, that you haven't been allowing yourself. But I think the deeper self love is using that sort of internal en- energy to really get to know yourself, to heal yourself, and to ultimately free yourself. So it's really about an internal dynamic. And what I like to say is if the self love is real, not only are you changing your life, but it starts opening the door to unconditional love for all beings. Mm. So it doesn't have to be perfect unconditional love, but it starts opening that door because if you're building more compassion for yourself and you're noticing your patterns and you're seeing yourself go through your emotional spectrum, then that you know gives you more compassion for other people as well because you see like, oh, the way I've struggled, other people have struggled as well. And... I think, you know, not only is it really valuable to do this work on the individual level because you can change your life, but I think historically that's what we've been missing all along. Like there have been so many times where groups of people have tried to change the world for the better They have, and they've had great values, but then they end up actually recreating the ills that they were once fighting against. Yeah. And this happens repeatedly. And I think what we didn't have before was we didn't have that internal dynamic that we now have where we actually have tools that can help us heal ourselves, that can help us um, sort of decrease the roughness of the mind. Because one thing that happens is like power functions like a magnet, right? So power will literally pull out the roughest parts of the ego and bring them to the surface. And that's what happens when good people, a lot of good people gain power and they become these sort of like uglier versions of themselves. But we can avoid, you know, repeating that story over and over again by dealing with our inner roughness right now Mm, right yeah and that's no easy thing again because I think to really feel and I'm no way nailing it I think you know it's undulating isn't it some days I think yeah I feel uh probably my self-love feels like peace like oh it's less noisy up there today it's just less of a a sort of acerbic voice going or I can at least notice that silly voice and go oh god shut up do you know what I mean boring yawn um But I think it's difficult because maybe one of the first things you need to do is go, what has everybody told me about myself? Mm, mm -hmm. And is it true? Mm -hmm. Because it's not to sort of like paper over everything and go, yes, I'm this perfect being and I can love myself. It's loving yourself for your wrongdoings, your mistakes. Exactly. The perceived flaws, whatever it might be. Because I remember being in my 20s and going... I really need to work on this self-love thing. And, you know, I'd really try and cultivate it. And then having been in the public eye for since I was a kid, mm-hmm. having then an outside source say, you're an idiot or you're this, I'd then feel foolish yeah. for feeling self-love yeah. because someone was telling combating that with something yeah. else. And I think now in my 40s, I'm probably able to just go, I can make a distinction between outside noise, which could be to some people, family members, work colleagues, whoever yeah. it might be they have yeah. trouble with. And what you know to be true, which isn't perfect, but you know yeah. that it's true and you have that awareness. I think, you know, some people that I've spoken to over the years or communicated with on social media when we've brought up this deeply important subject is they feel they can't reach self-love because they've been told so many times they're a terrible person. Uh, or yeah. and, and and you can get very stuck in that, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's really, it's one of the major challenges because when we start exploring our own inner territory, our own inner forest, we need to move in there with acceptance. Like like what you said, we have to be able to accept the good and the rough and be able to embrace it all, but simultaneously also understand that that acceptance should be combined with action, right? Because it it should be like, it's not going to be easy to, you know, to love yourself and accept yourself wholly as you are. But At the same time, you will also recognize that, oh, there are these qualities that I should develop, right? I I could develop being more present. I could develop being kinder to myself and other people. I could develop more balance of mind and less reactiveness. So you can get to work, right? There are these tasks that come up. But I think not punishing yourself through the process and realizing that, okay, what other people have said, they, they can't fundamentally assess my value. Like my value is internal and it's it's great no matter what. It's great whether I'm in a rough period in my life or or it's great when I'm in a great period yes. in my life. And I think that's really critical to understand. So not only is self-love acceptance, but it's also action. So 
every time that you're doing yoga, every time that you're meditating, every time that you're setting a new boundary, these are moments when you're actively practicing your self-love. And that includes every time that you are trying to help another human being. That's also you loving yourself because helping other people is going to really support your peace of mind. Yeah. Oh, my God. Isn't that true? It's like the most beautiful thing you can do for yeah. someone else and yourself. And I love it because I think the realization that I'm really having talking to you is because this is something I've just certainly struggled with is, is self-love is you don't have to be the perfect person to love yourself. No. It's literally yeah, that exactly. simple. You don't have to be this enlightened, perfect being who never makes mistakes no. yeah. to, to love yourself. It is absolutely possible. There's, again, something that, that has uh, come from your, your meditation and, and your clarity, and it's on page 127, which I've dog-eared here, and you say you don't need to jump into every argument or give your opinion on every matter, which I was like... This is the most important thing that we need to talk about <laughs> because in this day and age of social media, I sometimes feel a bit like sick because I think I'll be watching some massive thing play out, mm -hmm. whether it's socially, culturally, on a celebrity level, political level, whatever level's going on. There's a big juicy subject that's doing the rounds. Yeah, yeah. And everyone's got an opinion and it's something they need to say. And sometimes I think... I don't really have an opinion. Like I genuinely yeah, think, yeah. I don't bloody know. I, I don't yeah. know enough about either of the two people involved. I don't know enough about the subject matter. And I sort of feel scared is yeah. my feeling. I want to yeah. retreat. And yeah. I think it's become this strange notion that if you don't say something, you have then, an opinion. Then you're bad. You're a bad person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, so this really funny thing happened to me. Um, when so my wife and I we we did a forty five day meditation retreat between January and February of this Whoa. year. Whoa! Yeah, is 40, this a silent one or yeah, your it's what? totally silent? Forty five days. Yeah, and we had no phone, no internet. You know, um, everything was on pause. And when I came out, um, I felt lighter than ever. And then I turned to the internet, and I you know told my audience I was like yeah hey, I was like I'm back I started started posting and tweeting and especially when I tweeted people were like they were they were like don't check the news don't and I was like whoa I was like what happened and the war had broken out in Ukraine wow and I had no idea about it and I'm so I'm starting to watch how people are posting all these different things and I felt that same thing was like oh I should start posting too like you know but I realized, I was like, whoa, whoa, I was like, pump the brakes, dude. You have no idea what's going on. Yeah. You literally know zero. And all this stuff started weeks ago. First, start learning. Just learn. And it's okay if it's slow. And I, I honestly, like, I'd rather catch heat for being slow than for just jumping on the bandwagon and feeling like I have to mimic what other people are saying because things are happening so fast and people will just start posting right, you know, right one, at, one after another but did you really have time to check out what's actually happening nope. and to check out multiple sides of what's happening? Yeah. Like the reality is no, it's like, you, you know, so I, one thing when, especially when global things are happening, I challenge myself to actually learn about what's going on before I talk about it because I have a big audience and I have to, you know, do my due diligence and respect their minds and the attentions that they're giving me because you, you got to be careful with these things. Without yeah. a doubt. And I think it happens within our own little ecosystems as well. You know, there could be two friends who are getting into something, having an argument, and, mm -hmm. and you feel like, yeah, I need to say my opinion or whatever. Oh, it's yeah. like, do, do I? Do I need to back up one person or the other or get no, involved in this no, drama? Yeah. No, I, no. I actually I actually wrote at this, so this idea, I started writing about this particular topic after, um, I think, last year's Thanksgiving. And we were, so in the United States, you know, the family's together and we're celebrating Thanksgiving. And, you know, I'm hearing different, fa different family members talk about whatever subject. And then I realized in that moment, I was like, wait, I was like, I actually don't have to say anything right now. <laughs> I don't have to, you know, let me just like, hmm? Yeah. You know, like I don't need to like add any fuel to the fire. And, and, and I also realized in that moment, I was like, I don't need to just, I don't need to say everything that I'm thinking no nope. because it actually might create disharmony as opposed to harmony because one thing I'm trying to cultivate within myself is like not only do I want to walk gently as I'm moving around the world and with the people I'm, I'm interacting with but I also want to try my best to add harmony to the situations that I'm a part of yeah right so whatever peace I may have let me try to bring that peace out and bring people together um but sometimes that means by being quiet. Sometimes that means speaking up. But 
oftentimes it's like, no, I don't really need to say anything right now. Yeah, I think it's so important. And also, yeah. I remember Eckhart Tolle saying on a podcast, I can't think, it might have been an Oprah one, but mm. he, he was asked by an audience member a question about something global that was going on and to sort of talk about his thoughts and opinions to yeah. almost offer up his side of an argument. Mm. And he brilliantly sort of said... I will not be explaining my opinion on this situation because then I'll immediately cut off one half of my audience and I desperately want to reach as many people as possible because, you know, mm -hmm. without ego, he wants to put a message out there and to mm -hmm. help people. So as soon as you say, this is my stance and 50% of your audience bugger it's off, gone. Yeah. that's no yeah. good to anyone. So I thought that was a really honest but sensible way of going, I don't have to, you know, it's a very new concept that we have to wade in yeah. on, a, on yeah. an issue and say, these are my beliefs, this is my, this is the best version of an opinion that could be put out there. Yeah. It's like, it's just, it's also complicated and sometimes stepping back and being silent. Like, I, I've said this a million times on the podcast, but 200 years ago, nobody knew what was going on outside of the little area they lived yeah, in. And, exactly. and that didn't make them bad people. Yeah. They were just probably living a more local life, probably putting their help into local situations. And by uh, with all this sort of like wading into these big global or social topics, if you think you're doing it because you could help, great. But if you're just doing it to like make a point, what like what is that? I don't know. I just think sometimes yeah. silence is a really beautiful thing. I really, I really agree. And it's it's funny because um I think back to when the pandemic began, all of a sudden everybody became an epidemiologist. Yeah. And, and then people are sort of like weighing in on these things that, you know, it would take decades to really learn about yeah. properly to be able to have a proper view on on such a subject. And I feel like um, that's why slowing down feels so important to me because everything is just moving so fast. Like everything is so dependent on our productivity and how can we say things in a way where it'll get more clicks and likes. But in reality, it's like, if I try to live in this fast mode constantly, I'm just gonna be exhausting myself. And of course, like it's really valuable to understand what's happening globally, to be an active citizen of the world. But at the same time, you wanna balance that out. You know, you don't want to, uh, especially people who are like super open-hearted, you don't want to just like wear yourself down with the sorrows of the world 24 seven, especially if it's having a serious negative mental health impact on you. Like there are, you know, times when you can plug in, times when you can plug out because there's there's ample sorrow happening in the world. We should be attuned to it, but we also can't be like the, you know, just constantly in the mode of giving, giving, giving. Like yeah. there needs to be a balance so that we can serve ourselves and then give. And like that, you know, your service will be much better. Absolutely. Conserve the energy yeah. and, and expel it where you can and where you feel it's appropriate. I mean, the, the conclusion of, of your latest book, Lighter, is that healing is possible. And I think that that's so powerful to hear because there will be mm -hmm. plenty of people listening to us talk right now mm. who think it, it's not for me. I will never, ever feel better. And, and I can think to a time when I felt like that, you know, a certain period where I thought, I'll never not feel terrible. I'll never yeah. not feel yeah. sad, heavy, anxious. And sometimes that can still come in and I think, oh, is this ever going to go? And, you know, and maybe it won't go completely, but the process of healing is there. It's available to everyone. You, you know, you, like you say, find the technique that works for you, but it is possible for everybody. I think it really is. And I think whether we have experienced serious trauma or not, we can benefit from healing. Because once again, I wanna reiterate that point where every time that you react throughout the entirety of your lifetime, those reactions get accumulated in your mind. So you're just taking on more conditioning, taking on more conditioning, and sort of creating a situation where yourself, when you where you can come out of that conditioning so you can feel lighter, it's possible for all of us, whether we've experienced serious trauma or not. Yeah. it's You're never going to regret doing a bit of healing work, are you? No, no, no. <laughs> it can and, only be a good thing. Yeah. And doing a bit of yoga, some meditating or seeing a therapist, whatever it is that you need, it can make a massive difference. Yeah, it really can. I mean, your work is testament to that because certainly, you know, with inward pouring out and sort of managed to, sort of to connect with all these beautiful words and then with sharing your own story in lighter, it's such valuable work. I really appreciate uh, you writing these books and sharing your knowledge on, on your social media channels. It's, it's a beautiful thing that people can very simply hear brilliant stories mm -hmm, and powerful mm -hmm. words through the work that you're doing. So thank you. And, and thank, thank you, you for talking so today. Thank you so much, Fern. Thank you. This has been absolutely wonderful. 
I'm so grateful you made time for us to get together.